why aren't our prayers always answered immediately? Sometimes, of course, they are. And it's wonderful when we pray and the answer literally comes seconds or minutes afterwards. But as we know, that is not always the case. And the objective of this short message is to answer that question, which of course, in turn, helps us to see the big picture of God's dealings with man, which keeps us biblical in our way of thinking. It helps to avoid the I ask and God must do it now sort of attitude that sadly so often is found within churches. So why aren't our prayers always answered immediately? Well, first of all, God's timing. Think of the story of Lazarus. In John chapter 11, it tells us that Lazarus was sick, yet when he heard it, Jesus stayed where he was for two more days. Now, our natural reaction would be to drop everything, race over to Bethany and see what we could do. But Jesus saw the big picture and out of that came the raising of Lazarus from the dead, which even to this day, 2000 years later, is a term that even non-Christian people, non-church going people use. You will often hear people talk about a Lazarus from the death experience. And that is because Jesus understood God's timing. And we need to understand that when we bring our prayers, our requests before God. You see people at pedestrian crossings, so impatient, pushing the button time after time after time, but that button will not activate the little green man that gives us permission to cross the road until it's ready. We can become impatient, we can become frustrated, but you press it once, leave it, and then the green man tells us it's safe to cross. When we get impatient and we start to keep pushing the buttons of life, all we do is we end up frustrated and missing out on God's timing. I am the Lord, it tells us in Isaiah 60, God speaking, in its time I will do this swiftly. Hang on in there. If this is God speaking to you about a particular situation, the answer hasn't come yet. It will come, but recognize that God's timing is important. Secondly, there is warfare in the heavenlies. Thinking of the physical world in which we live, so often, even as Christians, we look for a natural answer to the situations that we find ourselves in. But we must remember that although we shouldn't be looking for a devil under every chair, we must remember that it is a spiritual world out there. It's not just a physical world that we live in, but there is a spiritual dimension as well. And I'm thinking of Daniel chapter 10 that brings this home to us perfectly. The first day you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. In other words, the moment the prayer was given, God heard. And I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there. This is not speaking about a natural phenomena, but rather something that is happening in the spiritual world. And the enemy uses delaying tactics. Delaying tactics, if we allow them to encroach on our way of thinking, ultimately cause us to give up. Because we pray it, it hasn't happened, two weeks, three weeks, three years, 20 years, whatever it may be, it hasn't happened, therefore I'm going to give up. God hasn't heard me, God has not answered my prayer, it's not going to work, we give up, we become discouraged. Hopefully we're not talking about 20 years, we're talking more about a shorter period of time, but sometimes in the big picture that God works, not man, but God works, it does take a long time for things to come together and then it all happens very, very 
quickly. So we have to recognize that there is this spiritual battle, this warfare in the heavenlies. Thirdly, we can pray outside of God's will. I've got a number of scriptures written down here on my netbook, but just to uh, read you a couple. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Many scriptures that we can draw from the Bible that encourage us to keep within the will of God. And the problem is that when we pursue a path that we're on, but God's not called us to, we expect, or sometimes we expect God to rubber stamp it. In other words, we expect God to come along, give his seal of approval to something that he hasn't called us to do, and then we pursue that particular walk in life. But it doesn't work like that. God can only bless that which he has called us to do, which is why it's so important to get into the will of God. It's something that I am always looking at my own life and my own ministry so that we can stay as much as possible, as much as is humanly possible, as far as we can in God's will so that we're not doing things in our own strength but rather we're doing what he wants us to do. When I travelled overseas, did a lot of overseas uh, missions in Africa during the 1990s and one of the uh, popular things that I got involved with was leadership seminars and we would do a number of topics, cover a whole range of leadership related issues. But the first one that I always, always did was the call of God. And I would say, perhaps not quite as blunt as this, but what I would say is that if you haven't got God's call on your life, you're wasting your time sitting through the other seminars. As I say, perhaps not as blunt as that, and I'm not saying that there wouldn't be value for people who aren't leaders in that, but bear in mind the context of where I'm talking now, that it's no good us trying to make ourselves leaders, in other words. It has to be the will of God. So if we're praying outside the will of God, whether it's the call to leadership or anything for that matter, then in effect, we're banging our head against a brick wall. We need to find out what God wants us to do and then wholeheartedly pursue that path. It'll be hard enough anyway to do what God wants us to do without making it impossible by trying to do it in our own strength because the Lord hasn't called us. And then finally, sin in our lives. Our prayers aren't answered because of sin in our lives. Not only will they not be answered immediately, they won't be answered. It talks in Leviticus about the sky above us being like iron. Deuteronomy, the sky above you will be like bronze. Isaiah, your sins have separated you from God so that he will not hear. And sometimes you hear folks talk in testimonies, give testimonies of how they went through a barren time, a difficult time, where they felt that their prayers were bouncing off the ceiling. And that's because we've allowed something to come in, sin, that separates us from God. And we need to deal with those things. It might be an attitude, a bad attitude, something that we've got in our lives, whatever it is, something that we're doing. But whatever it is, it's causing us to lose out on that relationship with God. 1 Peter 3, 7, Husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Bad relationships cause problems, not only between us and people, but between us and God. We can't say that we have a fantastic relationship with God, but we're at odds with everyone else. It doesn't work like that. The cross not only is vertical, it's also horizontal as well. And in order for us to have that clear access to God, we need to do what we do on our houses sometimes, clear the gutters out, get the rubbish out of the way so that we have that immediate, clear, clean access into God's presence.